Let's take our Bibles, look at James chapter number 3. Let's get to more serious matters here. And like Elizabeth Taylor told her last husband, I'm not going to keep you long. It's too nice a day to be in the church house. Just kidding. Last Sunday we left off in James chapter 3 verse number 12 where we saw that James was challenging us more about the use of our tongue. Y'all remember that? How many here, by the way, of hands would say that they have their speech and their tongue very much in control all of the time? No. Nobody. Okay, so I guess I'm in the right place. The contradiction that we sometimes find ourselves in, though, here is where we teach one thing. Can you imagine a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, uh, uh, an adult Sunday school teacher, a Bible college professor, or a Christian school teacher teaching the children or teaching the people one thing and then them doing the other? Yes. What? Is that possible? Yes. It is possible, and sometimes we're guilty of that, aren't we? Yes. Not because we mean to necessarily be contradictory, but, but because we often forget. We forget that we are a witness all of the time to someone. We never know when someone's watching us. We never know when someone is looking to us to see whether or not our spiritual life is real or not. Somewhere, somebody is watching us, and we're either a good testimony or we're a bad testimony. And I can't speak for you, but I know there's been times where I've not been the best of testimonies because of the things that have come my way and just let myself uh, get in the flesh and uh, just not been a good, good teacher. But it's a privilege to teach. We've been talking about that over the last several weeks. If you have been given an opportunity to teach God's Word in the church house uh, to either children or adults or anyone else in between, it's a, it's a privilege. And uh, we, we ought to take it very seriously, and we ought, we ought to realize that we're never off duty. Because just when you think that nobody is watching, somebody that you're teaching will see you do something that is not in keeping with a good testimony. So this afternoon, let's look at James chapter 3, verse number 13, and we're going to read down through verse 18. We'll finish off chapter 3 this afternoon. The Bible says, Who is a wise man? Endued with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye be bitter, envying, and if there, if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion, and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So here we find the principle of wisdom, and those who have the privilege of teaching should also have their tongues bridled. Yeah. Amen. If you claim to be a wise person, you, you would also understand that the things you say will either validate that you're a wise person or they will prove you guilty of not being a wise person. Now, true wisdom makes men meek. That's kind of contrary to what we hear in society. But true wisdom makes men meek. That's what this text we just read said. Men who are wise avoid strife and contention. And let's just face it, there's a lot of Christians who get caught up in arguing over the Bible, arguing over Scripture, and they get really angry. And, but men who profess themselves to be wise are easily, uh, should, should be able to easily avoid those kinds of arguments. Uh, in James 2, we learned that we ought to have works to back up our faith. In other words, if we say one thing, we ought to be what we say, not just talk. Way too much talk in our world that never gets followed through on. We don't, wanna, we don't work to be saved, but after we're saved, we should have godly works to prove that we are saved. And there's a real difference between men pretending to be wise 
And those who are truly wise, look again with me at verse 13 that we just read. It says, who is wise, who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. This verse tells us very, very plainly, a wise man, listen, is a knowing man. Now, what do we know? That's the question. What do we know? A, a child of God who has been given the opportunity to preach and teach the Word of God, uh, we ought to know some things about what we're teaching. Uh, we ought to know some things about the Bible. We ought to know some things that God wants from us as a teacher of His Word. And, and, the, and the truth of the matter is, a wise man is a knowing man. But let's just face it, we have a lot of people standing in Bible college classrooms. We have a lot of people standing in churches and Sunday school rooms and Christian schools who really do not have a good grasp of the Word of God, but they're still teaching nonetheless. And I'm not saying you have to be perfect in order to teach. What I am saying, though, is you ought to be uh, disciplined at your, at your teaching. You ought to speak the truth. And uh, you think about it this way. I could go out into the public and uh, I could ask people, hey, what do you know? And I would get all kinds of answers to that question. But here's the thing. Most of what I would get from the general public would be worthless in the long run. They know a lot of things about a lot of things, but none of it has an eternal makes an eternal difference in people's lives. The Word of God makes an eternal difference in people's lives. And that is why many who stand in front of uh, God's people and attempt to teach that's why it's, it's, it's a dangerous thing to do because you have such responsibility be, that's being entrusted to you. You have to be so careful about what you say and make sure that you get exactly the truth of God's Word out so people can take it and then begin to apply it to their lives and make changes as they need to. You know, many of our young Christians today out in the world, uh, and I don't mean in the world in a sinful way, but just in, you know, young Christians in the church, let me put it that way, they have all majored on the, many of them have majored on the wrong things. For instance, many young Christians can tell you the latest, greatest CCM song, contemporary Christian music. They can tell, oh, you've got to hear this song, Pastor. Oh, it, it just gets hold of my heart. I just, oh, it gives me goosebumps when I listen to this song. They can tell you about all those things. But then watch them in the church house when I say, take your Bibles and open to the book of Numbers. They're in the index trying to figure out where numbers is. So what I'm saying to you is what you need to know is God's word. That is the key. And if you're a teacher of God's word, you ought to know it more than those that you're teaching. But think about this. If you knew the greatest and best CCM song that's number one on the charts right now, selling all, you know, selling more than anything else, what would that get you? What would it get you? Nothing of any lasting value. As quick as it rises to the top, in a few years, most won't even remember it. So ask yourself, what will it get you? See, we have to fill our minds with the things that will last for eternity. Many of those folks who teach are, are not really knowing what they teach. Romans 10, verse 1 through 3 says, Brethren, this is... Paul speaking, he says, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Isn't that our prayer for those that we care about? We want those people that we have in our life that are unsaved. We want them to be saved. Paul had that burden for Israel. Then he says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Folks, that's the world we're living in. Many people that are Christian will tell you, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I've been, you know, I've been a Christian since you know, 10 years now. Ask them a Bible quote. Oh, I sure don't know about that. Ask them a simple like we did with the kids. I can tell you that some of those questions that I asked some of the kids, I could ask those questions of some adults and they wouldn't be able to give me the right answer. That's a shame. What does that tell us? It tells us that you have, you have to have a want to 
to gain the knowledge of God's Word that God wants us to have. You have to have a good teacher, but you also have to have a want to. The last verse in that passage that I just read in Romans gives us the key as to why people have a zeal, but they don't have the knowledge. And here it is. It says it right at the end of the verses. Verse 3, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. What does that mean? It means that they're picking and choosing what parts of God's Word they want to believe, and they're chucking aside the parts that they don't want to believe, the parts that make them uncomfortable. And as I've told you before, here at our church, we want to teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. We don't, we don't sugarcoat. We don't leave things out because I'm afraid it's going to, you know, uh, hurt our attendance. We preach the same thing week after week, regardless of who comes through the door. The last verse tells us that they've not submitted themselves. A truly wise man, that's what we're talking about wisdom here, will have the knowledge to back up his wisdom. That's what the verses that we just read at the beginning say. Verse 1 there in verse 13, I should say, Who is wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show, here it is, out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. He has wisdom because he's made a decision to submit to God. Wisdom is making the right application of the knowledge that we possess. You know, if you sit in a classroom and you get taught over and over and over and over and over, week after week, day after day, and at the end of the teaching you graduate, but you never take anything that you were taught and apply it to your life and start using it in your life, then you've wasted time. We teach because we want to grow. We teach because we want to mature in our faith. Wisdom is making the right application of the knowledge that we possess or the knowledge that we're given in teaching. And the second thing we see in verse 13 there is it brings good conversation. That doesn't mean that we all sit down with a cup of tea and drink pretentious drinks and talk about the world. No, we, we sit down and we, uh, we talk about things, yes, but our conversation in the Bible means a lot more than just having a, a talk with somebody. It's our lifestyle. That word conversation in the Bible means your lifestyle. So it says it brings a good conversation. What does that mean? It means that we have a lifestyle that is godly. We have a lifestyle that is spiritual. And when people think of us, they think, hey, hey that's, a, that's a believer right there. And they have a testimony that shows that they're a believer. Not that they're perfect, but that they have a good conversation. They have a good lifestyle. If we're wise, it will show in our life. We will be using words that inform, words that heal, and, then, and words that do good unto others. Instead of looking good but acting and living like the devil. Oh, well, too many times in our Christian life, that's us. Is it fair to say that many times we sacrifice our testimony on the altar of convenience? In other words, when we have an opportunity to give glory to God because of He saved us, He's given us eternal life, He's put us on the, the high road, and we, rather than be embarrassed, we just say you know, something else. We just let our testimony fall by the wayside. We don't say things like, well, I, I didn't drink the other night because I, I felt like it was wrong in God's eyes for me to be doing that. And I just believe what the Bible says about it, so I'm going to go with the Bible and not what my feeling says. But instead, what do we say? Well, I just don't drink. No glory to God. And I'm not saying that we should make a big show of our faith as far as in that way. But we need to give God credit for what God has done. And that means we've got to reference God once in a while and not be afraid to do so. I said that word conversation is not about mere words, it's about actions. Not someone who speaks well, but doesn't live well. And a wise person both lives well and acts well. That's what James is telling us here. And the third thing we take away from verse 13 is this. Truly wise people have a spirit of meekness about them. I can't speak for you, I can say this about me. 
Sometimes I just struggle in that way. I just, I do. God is still doing a work in my life and heart because of that. But you know, when we're mild and we're calm, we're best able to hear reason and able to speak it and eventually do it. Amen? Look at verse 14. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. I mean, I can just stop right there for a second. Think about this. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. I know people that would tell you they get all upset, they get almost angry, ready to argue, and they'll say this. Well, I can't help it, bless God. That's just the way I am. What did that verse say? God says right there in that verse, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. And lie not against the truth. If that's your testimony, if that's what shows forth mostly in your life, then you're not a meek person. Then it says, this wisdom descendeth not from above. So God didn't, God's not in that. But it is earthly, sensual, devilish, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Folks, that's pretty clear. We don't need an interpreter on that. Very clearly, it tells us what we are if that's what our lives are like. It says, verse 16, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Have you ever noticed when there's a lot of contention and strife in a group of people? It's just confusion. He says this, she says that, they say this, they say that. No one ever knows what's real and what's true. But if we're calm and we're meek, we should be able to get our words out without having that contention and strife. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is, show, is sown in peace of them that make peace. So there's a whole lot here. But let me just give you a couple of thoughts and we'll be done. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. What does that mean? It means it's without defilement. It's without malice. Uh, it's without a lot of those things that we think of when we think of pure. It's without sin. That's the Word of God, folks. Did you know that this is the purest book in the world? There's no, there's no book purer than this one. It has everything that God wants us to know. It has everything in here that God loves. It tells us everything God hates. And yes, by the way, God does hate certain things. Sorry to break your bubble with your mom, what she told you. God hates certain things. He loves certain other things. He despises certain actions that men commit. Uh, but what he wants most of all is he wants us to measure what's in our life and whether or not it's pure according to the standard of this book. And if we'll do that, we can't go wrong. This book is infallible, which means it's not capable of teaching error in and of itself. But it says then, peaceable. That's a tough one. Because sometimes when we teach the Word of God straight and true as we can, there's a lot of folks who get very offended about it. And it wouldn't seem peaceable to them. But you notice, these, these words are in a, in a sequence. It says first pure. So in other words, we've got to give them the pure truth first. And as they digest it with a willing heart, they'll find great peace in what is said. And once they find that peace, it'll be gentle feeling to them. It'll, be, it'll give them a gentleness. It'll help them to be calm and it'll help them to, to, uh, 
to, to be the way that they should be. And then it says easy to be entreated. What does that mean? It means that it's easy to understand. It's easy to accept. It's easy to, to have all of those things fall into place in sort of a good, good manner. But it says full of mercy and good fruits. If you'll allow the Word of God to penetrate our hard hearts, it will be pure and it will be, it'll give us a peace and it'll help us to be more gentle. It'll be easier to be uh, uh, understood and received and it'll help us to be merciful. See, we're, sometimes we're not very merciful as Christians. We ought to be, but sometimes we're not. And it'll produce good fruit. And that fruit will be without partiality because it'll be God's fruit. Without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You know, we need to teach the literal Word of God. Stop relying on men's books about the Word of God. And just teach the Word of God. If we'll do that, you'll be amazed at what will happen. Notice the descriptions of the right kind of wisdom that we're looking at here. It gives us all of the good words. Amen. And by the way, that's what God wants us to have. We're never going to win the loss to Christ if we don't understand these things. If we don't get it in our mind and our heart that we don't have to be harsh and that we don't have to be condescending and that we don't have to be all those things that we tend to be sometimes and just let people know what the Word of God says, but let them know in a spirit of meekness. You know, I've said before many times, my wife will tell me I shouldn't say it as much, but I didn't write the book. I'm just tasked to teach it. And, and I've said to you also many times, if it were up to me, I probably would change some things. The things that make me uncomfortable. The things that make you uncomfortable. The things that you just can't seem to wrap your head around and say, I don't understand why he wants us to do that. What's the big deal? But it is a big deal. Because God created us. He knows, best what's, he knows what's best for us. He, he knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us better than anyone else. And I believe He's given us these truths in His Word. And I believe He, he knows what's best for us and we just need to accept what He's given. Amen? Let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you once again for this opportunity that we've had to come. And Father, I do thank you for the faithfulness that our church family shows to the church house and to your word. And so, Father, we ask you as we get ready to depart that you would give us safety this week as we go about our business, that we would be a testimony, that we would be living in a good conversation so that others might ask us, what is the hope that lies within you? Why do you seem to be different than everyone else that I meet in society? Hopefully, Father, you'll give us opportunity this week to answer that question with someone who still needs to be saved, that's still undone and lost without Christ. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.